Milton had this wonderful image, which I repeat all the time, and this is what he said. You've got a boat, and it has a hole in the front, and it's starting to sink. And somebody says, what are we going to do to level the boat? And Milton says, if you're a socialist, what you'll do is you'll bash a hole in the back of the boat. And what Milton was always in favor of was patching the hole rather than creating another hole. And the difference is if you patch the first hole, the boat will float. If you create the second one, it will sink all the more rapidly. There is a strong theme in Milton, which I think has to be honored, which is Milton said, fine tuning is for violins. And I, to make it quite precise is if you actually go and look at a violin, you'll see that for the E string, for example, there are two ways to tune it. There's something back at the handle and you twist that little knob. But with the E string, the frequencies are very high and you have to get it exact. So there's another little piece at the front and you twist that one to fine tune the violin. Now, what Milton basically said is economies are not violins. It's not a single guy trying to produce a single tone. And so you don't want anybody sitting out there trying to act as though there's an E string out there, which if he pulled upon, somehow he could fix things right. So Milton was smart enough to understand the limits of his own knowledge and to advocate policies that reduce discretion in order to create an additional level of uncertainty, which would work itself through the system. Everybody has to have their niche, and what was so great about Milton is he knew himself quite well, and he always went to the areas of his strength. Milton and I have interacted at both ends of the career. Um, I arrived at Chicago from four years at the University of Southern California in 1972, and by that time Milton was a giant who walked across the University of Chicago stage. I could recall meeting him several times at various workshops, listening to badger people. Um, he was a very deceptive man. He had a small body, but he had a huge voice. And one of his great intellectual powers was the incredible speed by which he could cut to the heart of a problem. My moment of fame with him at the University of Chicago came when I had written this paper on medical malpractice, the case for contract, and Milton took out a paragraph and gave it as a final examination question to his students and announced that they had to explain why the error was in the particular paper, whatever it was, and anybody whose errors were thought worthy of Milton became some kind of a stage figure in the eyes of students. They said, you made a mistake that he thought worth correcting, and this was greeted as a kind of a source of genuine approbation, so I was permanently thrilled with all of that. And I had the great privilege to speak um, at a ceremony in his honor uh, at the Hoover Institution shortly after he died. And, and the one story I told which actually got the most attention from everybody had nothing whatsoever to do with his giant intellectual achievements. Um, I reported the following incident. My wife and I were driving up Palm Drive one day, which is the main thoroughfare on the Sanford campus, and we see this vehicle in front of us which seems to be driving without a driver, and it's going very slow. And we look around, no driver, nobody in the passenger speed. So what we do is we speed up in order to see who this non-person is who's driving the car, and there sits Milton in the driver's seat and his wife Rose sitting next to him in the passenger seat. And the reason why the story had such impact I was told later, is that 90% of the people in the audience had no idea that Milton was very short. And that what you did was manage to get some kind of human element onto this guy because people always thought of him in terms of his voice, which was very big. And indeed at Chicago, one of the great all-time pictures, as on University Avenue, Milton was with his close friend George Stigler. And George was about six foot four and very thin, and he came from Spokane, Washington. And you see a picture from the rear with George and Milton walking down almost arm in arm. And, you know, George is about uh, 14 inches taller than Milton. And so everybody kind of said, well, they're obviously opposites in one regard, but they're certainly kindred spirits in another. So there's a lot of personal lore about Milton. And I think many people don't forget that with all great people, there's a human side, and his was rather interesting. I think most people do not understand how nice and kind and caring a man Milton turned out to be when he was actually working with, quote, real people. Uh, in order to be a good economist, in order to be a good lawyer, what you have to do is to dehumanize people. But, you know, it's one thing to figure out how you set rules to govern the lives of other people, and it's another thing to figure out how you run your own life. Now, the first guy who understood that was Aristotle, who started to talk about all the ethical virtues of moderation. There is no legal duty to be moderate in any sense of the word. 
And Milton never wanted to say that because, hey, you know, there's self-interest out there in the world that I have to worry about. That means that somehow or other when I deal with my graduate students and my family and my friends, I'm going to be selfish just for the sheer fun of it. He was, in fact, a generous guy. Certainly in his prime, Milton was always had so much energy and so much vitality uh, that he was a kind of a helping party. And it's very important to break this kind of stereotype, which is, oh, if you believe in conservative market institutions, you're a louse. There's just no correlation, and you don't want to draw it. And Milton, in fact, scored very well as a human being.